Hello everyone. So proceeding with the next chapter of abnormal uterine bleeding. We are basically discussing the causes of abnormal uterine bleeding. That is the palm coin classification. And we have already discussed about P, A and L. That is polyps, adenomyosis and leomyoma or uterine fibroids in our previous videos. Next on the list is M. That is malignancy. The common gynecological cancers that we encounter are vulvovaginal cancer, cervical cancer, uterine or endometrial cancer, and ovarian cancer. So vulvovaginal cancer is comparatively a rare entity among which vulval cancer accounts to 1 to 5% of all the genital cancers and vaginal cancers account to 0.2% of all the cancers in women. Cervical cancer is the leading gynecologic cancer which is most commonly encountered in the women of our country followed by endometrial cancer. Now covering the topic of malignancy is next to impossible in one single video. So in this video we shall be only discussing about endometrial cancer and we will be discussing about the other forms of malignancy or cancer in our upcoming videos. So we have discussed in depth about the wall of uterus and everything about endometrium in our previous videos. So I would like you to watch these videos in series sequence to get a better understanding about the topic. So endometrium is nothing but the inner lining of the uterus. So this is the myometrium, the wall of the uterus. The outer lining is the serosa or the perimetrium. And the endometrium is the inner lining of the uterus, which is shed during menstruation. So, as we have discussed, after cervical cancer, endometrial cancer is one of the most common form of gynecologic cancer encountered in our country. And it is most commonly seen in postmenopausal women. So the average age of onset of this cancer is 5th to 7th decade of life. So women in the age group of 50 to 70 years are more likely to fall prey to endometrial cancer. Now before going further, we need to have a basic understanding about the action or the role of estrogen and progesterone on the endometrium during the menstrual cycle. So in a 28-day menstrual cycle, when we divide it into two, the action of estrogen supervenes in the first 14 days, which we call the follicular phase. Now let us look into the zoomed-in picture of the ovary. Now let us now this is the ovary. If we zoom in, if we take an inside look of the ovary, it looks somewhat like this. Here we have the maturing follicles. Okay which is responsible for secreting estrogen and the estrogen secreted by these maturing follicles is responsible for proliferation or creating the endometrial bed inside the uterus during the first 14 days okay so in short we can say estrogen during the first 14 days secreted by these maturing follicles it you know, builds in builds the endometrium inside the uterus for a possible implantation. Okay. Now, on the 14th day, there is a sudden spike in luteinizing hormone, which leads to ovulation. Okay. Here we can see there is ovulation, the matured follicle. Okay. The ovum is released from this mature follicle. This is the image of ovulation which happens on the 14th day after ovulation the follicle will turn into corpus luteum which is basically the dead follicle now this corpus luteum okay this here is the corpus luteum this follicle will regress into corpus luteum all right now this corpus luteum is responsible for secreting progesterone in increased concentration. Now this we can call is the next part of the menstrual cycle. First 14 days, this is the 14th day. Now from 14th to 28th day, 
corpus luteum secretes progesterone in increased concentration so this here is the luteal phase because the corpus luteum is what supervenes the progesterone secreted by corpus luteum is what is supervening here now what does this progesterone do progesterone secreted by this corpus luteum here is responsible for bringing about secretory changes in the endometrium in simple words progesterone has the opposite action of estrogen on the endometrium and it is come in to break down whatever estrogen has built in these 14 days okay estrogen has built a layer of endometrium inside the uterus in the first 14 days now progesterone has come into picture to break down this endometrium if there is no implantation if there is no pregnancy okay now that is why after on the 28th day it brings about secretory changes during the next 14 days and the sudden withdrawal of progesterone okay will lead to bleeding on the 28th day so this was basically the action of estrogen and progesterone during the 28 day menstrual cycle now understanding the action of estrogen and progesterone was important because the underlying cause of endometrial cancer is unopposed estrogen so progesterone is absolutely mandatory to be secreted after 14th day okay or after ovulation to counteract the effect of estrogen because what is the uh, function of estrogen building up of this endometrial lining okay which is only supposed to happen on the first 14 days or till ovulation so if there is no progesterone to counter act this action what will happen there will be continuous action of estrogen and it will go on proliferating the endometrium okay and this layer will become thicker and thicker there will be continuous proliferation of endometrium the layer of endometrium okay this will then lead to endometrial hyperplasia which is a precursor or another risk factor for endometrial cancer so understanding the role of estrogen and progesterone was absolutely mandatory let us go through the risk factors of endometrial cancer the primary cause or risk factor of endometrial cancer as we have already discussed is unopposed estrogen exposure now the causes of this unopposed estrogen exposure can be divided into endogenous causes which means the causes inside the body and exogenous causes that is the causes outside our body let us go through the endogenous causes of estrogen excess so first on the list is polycystic ovarian syndrome now we know that in pcos or polycystic ovarian syndrome the menstrual cycles are quite irregular and the primary reason for that irregularity is an ovulation we have already seen about ovulation in the previous you know in the initial part of this video that only after ovulation the ruptured follicle develops into corpus luteum there is a uh, secretion of progesterone to counteract the effect of estrogen to bring about secretory changes in the endometrium and the sudden withdrawal of that progesterone will bring about menses will cause bleeding so when there is no ovulation definitely there is no development of corpus luteum no secretion of progesterone and what remains here or what supervenes here is estrogen so there is no op opposition for the estrogen it will go on proliferating the endometrium so that is why pcos polycystic ovarian syndrome and anovulation are two primary or major risk factors for endometrial cancer next we have is endometrial hyperplasia endometrial hyperplasia is a premalignant lesion that is 
uh, it is a precursor for endometrial cancer if we find endometrial hyperplasia in a woman she is at a higher risk of developing endometrial cancer next we have is obesity diabetes and hyperlipidemia now diabetes hyperlipidemia they all are interrelated to obesity in obesity uh, there is reduced level of serum sex hormone binding protein which allows free estrogen to circulate in the body leading to estrogen excess so it will uh, definitely lead it will definitely bring about an excessive amount of estrogen in the body and moreover in obese individuals peripheral conversion of steroid hormone is aromatized into estrone in the peripheral fat which again leads to estrogen excess continuing with the endogenous causes of unopposed or increased estrogen exposure we have early menarche late menopause and nulliparity menarche as we know is the onset of menstruation in an adolescent girl and menopause is the cessation of menstruation so in early menarche and late menopause women are going to be exposed to estrogen for a longer period throughout their lifetime so if a woman has a longer reproductive life span she will be exposed to increased estrogen increasing the risk of endometrial cancer similar is the case in nulliparity nulliparis means she has not been pregnant ever so during pregnancy there is no menstruation so at least during those 9 months she is not very much exposed to estrogen which is not the case in a nulliparous woman nulliparous women in comparison to multiparous women are exposed to more amount of estrogen during their life span increasing the risk of endometrial cancer coming to the exogenous causes of unopposed or excessive estrogen exposure first on the list we have is hormone replacement therapy so menopausal women are often offered hormone replacement therapy where there is again increased estrogen exposure next we have is a drug called tamoxifen tamoxifen is a medication used to treat breast cancer which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator tamoxifen primarily has an anti estrogenic effect in the breast tissue but has the opposite action in the uterine tissues where it has estrogen agonistic action and it acts to enhance the proliferation of endometrium and leads to endometrial hyperplasia and cancer there may also be family uh, history or a genetic predisposition to endometrial cancer signs and symptoms of endometrial cancer first we have is abnormal uterine bleeding and of course this is the entire discussion about so the woman may experience abnormal or excessive menstrual bleeding heavy menstrual bleeding for prolonged days all right then we have already discussed that it affects women in the 5th to 7th decade uh next we have is post menopausal bleeding now one of the major causes of post menopausal bleeding is endometrial cancer and another important thing to remember is that cervical cancer is another very common cause of post menopausal bleeding so endometrial cancer causes post menopausal bleeding uh, increased severity of bleeding in perimenopausal women now normally in perimenopausal women we see that there is decreased frequency of menstrual cycles and decreased menstrual uh, decreased amount of menstrual bleeding that normally happens and towards the end towards menopause it completely stops in endometrial cancer or if there is any abnormality there is increased severity of bleeding she will experience increased bleeding okay for a prolonged time all right next symptom we have is the dirty vaginal discharge now this is the uterus okay here we have you know uh, an endometrial cancer developing now this cancer could invade into the uterine cavity like a cauliflower like growth and there could be a discharge from this particular cauliflower like cancerous growth okay there could be some kind of dirty discharge from this kind of growth 
so the woman may complain of dirty vaginal discharge next we have is pelvic pain now if the cancer is invading into the adjacent pelvic structures okay this suppose it is it has penetrated into the myometrium it has crossed the serosa and it is invading into the pelvic structures okay so that could lead to pelvic pain now coming to the investigations to be done for diagnosing endometrial cancer so the investigation which helps us to reach a diagnosis is endometrial aspiration and sampling of the endometrium followed by histopathology but if this comes out to be negative and the woman still continues to bleed because there are certain chances that the reports may be falsely negative we can then proceed with fractional curettage with hysteroscopy and biopsy for better evaluation and confirmation because while hysteroscopy we have a chance to get a better look of the entire uterine endometrium okay the entire uterine lining and select biopsies from the suspicious areas so it helps to reduce the chances of missing out a lesion okay so proceeding with the investigations ultrasound particularly the transvaginal sonography help us to guide about the endometrial thickening okay and also about the adjacent structures like fallopian tubes ovaries and also the other pelvic structures if there is any kind of uh, extension of the cancer to the cervix that can also be recognized with the help of transvaginal sonography okay mri helps to evaluate the involvement of cervix and also the myometrial involvement if there is any extent or invasion of the endometrial cancer into the myometrium or you know that uh, mri gives a better picture of the same ct scan puts light on any kind of lymph node involvement the uh, pelvic lymph nodes or the inguinal lymph nodes are involved ct scan gives a better idea about the same so these tests basically help us or give us a better guidance in choosing the further treatment plan all right so that's it for today stay tuned guys we shall be discussing about the types of endometrial cancer staging of endometrial cancer and also about the treatment plan in brief in the upcoming video so do not forget to subscribe your health oasis so stay tuned everyone as we will be continuing with the discussion of abnormal uterine bleeding in our upcoming videos do consider to like share and subscribe to the channel if this information was useful to you and follow me on instagram for more such helpful health related topics thank you